Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to tonight's sessional event, A Cashless Society Risk, Benefits and Issues. So during the Christmas, I was scrolling through my online bank statement, and what I found most surprising was, was not the rapid deterioration in my bank balance, but rather the fact that I hadn't been to an ATM in over four months. So contactless debit card, credit card, Google Pay, Apple Pay, all of these electronic payments made me realize how easy it is to wander around London to the chorus of approving beeps. So a cashless society is certainly in motion in a large number of countries around the world. And tonight we will explore, discuss and debate these issues. I am delighted to introduce our first speaker this evening, which is Ian Collier. So Ian is chair of the Cashless Society Working Party. He has been a fellow of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries since 1977. He is now in retirement and is an active volunteer at the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. His professional work experience was in life insurance, investment banking and capital markets. Ian has seven grandchildren and wonders if any of them will ever own a checkbook or even pay for goods with cash when adults. So please welcome Ian. Thank you, Crevin. Um, and welcome everybody to a Staple Inn this evening uh, for the presentation of our paper, A Cashless Society Benefits, Risks and Issues. And for those of you that have read the 42,000 words of the paper, you will probably be um, shocked to hear that this is just an interim paper. I would like first to mention the authors of the paper. Um, Justin Chan lives and works in Singapore, and for that reason isn't with us this evening. Sheila Nardani um, is nursing a newly born baby, and again, is not with us. They both um, uh, send their regards and wish this evening success. Samuel Accord here on, on the platform um, will be speaking very shortly about negative interest rate policies. And Sabrina Rochemont, who will be joining the platform um, in a few minutes, um, will be talking mostly about the cashless world in motion, where we look at what's happening around the world. Sabrina is not a member of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and so I'd like to thank her specifically um, for the time and the enormous effort that she's put into um, tonight's proceedings and the paper. I have to say that the paper was designed to be as neutral as possible. It examines the benefits, the risks and issues across all the different stakeholder groups and across economies in different stages of development. And let me tell you, each and every one of them has a different answer. First of all, and let's see if this works, it does, it seems. First of all, I would like to make a few short definitions, and we've left them in the most simplest possible fashions. We define, for the sake of this paper, a cashless society as one without notes and coin. We talk about decaching, and decaching is the process of reducing the amount of notes and coin used within an economy. And we talk also uh, a lot about digital currencies. There are many different definitions of what a digital currency is, but for the sake of our paper, we've called it a cryptocurrency, which is effectively electronic money, but with a blockchain element. More of that later. And what have we learned? Well, in section seven of our paper, we do a SWOT analysis, and I mentioned the different stakeholder groups. And for the sake of our paper, we've used the stakeholder groups as being the public, non-financial businesses, 
governments and central banks, commercial banks, and the payment ecosystem. All of them have totally different benefits, risks, and issues. And there isn't a solution for any one of them. The demands and the, 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 the desires to go cashless are different for them all. We've also learned that decaching is happening, and it's happening um, at different pace around the world. But what we don't believe is going to happen is the process is going to start reversing. But what have we learned more? We've learned that there's so much more to learn. We, we are going to enter into phase two of our paper um, almost straight after this session or meeting. And we couldn't delay the publication of this paper because things are happening so rapidly across the world that it would have been really unconstructive to delay it. Some articles that we read can be out of date within 12 months. There is definitely a major rate of change. And in phase two, we've already had names of, we advertised for names for volunteers for phase two, and we've already had six people who put their names forward. We believe that there will be some specialist skills needed, and if anything grabs you from things that we speak about tonight, uh, we would be delighted to hear from you for phase two. Benefits, risks, and issues. Well, in section three, we talk about the benefits of a cashless society. Now, the cost of handling cash is enormous, and it changes as a percentage of GDP across the world. So, for example, the best estimates in the Western world are as much as half a percent of GDP. In India, for example, the numbers quoted, and these are very difficult to substantiate, could be as high as 3% of GDP. That's just handling cash. We are looking at the reduction in tax evasion that could emanate from a cashless society. Reduction in crime, corruption, illegal immigration, benefit fraud, modern day slavery. These are issues which a cashless society could certainly help tackle. We talk about how a cashless society could even give us other options, and I'm going to talk about capital markets in a few moments, but the taxation system could be totally revolutionized, and we talk about an automated payment transaction tax, which is a levy on all taxes, on all, all transactions, which can only be done in a cashless society, and that's all in section three of the paper. Sam is going to talk about negative interest rates, which, in all honesty, um, a negative interest rate policy becomes most possible in a cashless society. But with benefits, there are also risks and issues. And in section six, we look at no fewer, and we've identified no fewer, and there are probably more, than 20 risks and issues. Each of them, um, ha each of them are different, um, each of them are, are result in a debate in their own right, and we will come back to a number of them in phase two of our research. However, of the risks and issues that we've come across, the one I think that worries the um, working party the greatest is risk 13 in section six, i.e. it's what might happen in a totalitarian government. There is no doubt that for good or bad, cash provides a certain amount of, 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 um, uh, of obliqueness, we don't know, a bit of privacy in our transactions. And the wrong totalitarian government could control dissidents very easily by just denying them the ability to open bank accounts. Again, we'll be returning to that in phase two and look for solutions to that particular problem. In section five, we look at financial exclusion. Now, this is a hot topic. It's a hot topic by some of the pressure groups, um, looking particularly at um, age-related organizations, but also in um, parliament select committees. We know, and they know, that decaching in some societies, certainly in the UK, is happening already, and it's happening by stealth. I, it's not being planned, it's just happening. And this can cause a great deal of problems for 
the um, unbanked, the technically naive, and, and maybe some elderly people. And we understand that. And we, we notice that there is a problem. The bank branches are closing. Should the state have a duty to provide a cash alternative if the clearing banks find um, providing cash unviably, commercially unviable? How would you transition to a cashless society? And that's something else which we will come back to, transition management in phase two. In section five, we also look at the financial inclusion and exclusion of decaching in countries in different stages of their economic development. And we find that it's very different for each of those different types of economy. And if cash were taken away from an economy, would there be sufficient numbers of people, rightly or wrongly, that would like to replace it? For example, could you see dollars or euros floating around um, instead of pound notes or pound coins or, or 20 pound notes or whatever? We think barter and, and, and exchange of items of worth are less um, efficient. So digital currencies could now come in. And, and we all know about Bitcoin. Um, but that's just one of a number of different possibilities of digital currencies. And how would displacement towards alternative form of payments outside the Bank of England control, or let's say the central bank control, how would that affect financial stability in a country if it couldn't even control the currency being used within its own economy? Could digital currencies usurp the use of any central bank's own currency? We'll be looking at that under phase two. And how could the central bank control that? Is it likely that the central bank will issue its own digital currency? And we know that the Bank of England, and I think we have some actuaries here this evening from the Bank of England, um, and, and maybe they'll, they'll, they'll help the discussion, I don't know. How, what would happen? And we know that the Bank of England have actually um, conducted a proof of concept. What we don't know necessarily is what the answer is. And if the Bank of England did introduce a digital currency, what would that mean for the entire banking ecosystem? It could totally disintermediate the commercial banks and their function. Again, we'll be coming back to that in phase two. There must be something here, ladies and gentlemen, that you want to get your teeth into and help us on phase two. But the next one is one is my capital markets background I really enjoy thinking about. Could digital currencies, could they revolutionize capital markets? Now, many of us might think of loan, of cash, not cash, of money as a series of loans. So the, the £20 note you have in your pocket, it says, I promise to pay the bearer. It's an IOU from the Bank of England. If you've got £20 deposited at HSBC, all you've done is lend HSBC some money. So if a large corporate, let's say Apple, for example, wanted to come to the stock exchange and wanted to raise money in lieu of an IPO, in lieu of selling equity maybe, or in lieu of um, debt, um, issuing debt um, bonds, for example, could they issue their own digital currency? That currency would be traded not on the stock exchange, like their shares, like their, their bonds, but was traded on, on an FX market. And instead, if you wanted to get liquidity out of that asset you hold, you would actually have to sell it on the stock exchange. You could actually trade it, and it's spendable at, eight, at, 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 um, at stores anywhere. So the whole prospect of the um, capital markets could be totally disintermediated by digital currencies. Is that around the corner? No, the answer is probably not. Is it going to happen? I don't know. But it could do. And it's something that if it doesn't happen here, might happen somewhere else. And if we believe that the UK has an advantage in capital market transactions, if somebody else comes up with a totally different idea, which suddenly usurps that idea, I think we need to be um, at least in control. So that's it. For my, that, that's our paper, our 42,000 words in, in about 10 minutes. Um, but clearly, there's a lot more to come. And hopefully, um, I, I, I hope so. many of you will be able to add to the discussion this evening. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Ian. 
Our second speaker this evening is Samuel Accord. Sam is a senior actuary with Nordea Life and Pensions in Copenhagen. Prior to Nordea, he worked as a reinsurance pricing actuary with RGA in London. Sam is a fellow of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and a chartered enterprise risk management actuary. He's an active volunteer recently contributing to working groups on equity release and use of economic modeling within the profession. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming here this evening. I kind of wonder why have you come here this evening. I think the only thing I've seen sold out as well is the professionalism seminar. Um, I hope you read the paper, because I, I don't think we can summarize it in 10 minute slots. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed trying to understand uh, NERP, negative interest rate policies. There's a lot of really clever people out there with good analyses and good interpretations. Um, for better or worse, kind of every question answered in our paper seems to have raised three new questions. So we didn't solve anything. <laughs> we know more, but we also know that we know a lot less than we should know. Um, so in that spirit, the following slides will raise some questions that hopefully foster debate on negative interest rates. Um, I guess starting with w w what are negative interest rates? Seems like a dumb question. Um, you know, they may be the main driver for going cashless. If you've read Rogoff's book, you know, that this is what um, allows for negative interest rates to be implemented. Without it, you can't do it. Um, and in doing it, I found that my, in researching it, I found my economics at education very lacking. And I don't think I'm alone in this. I think it's a very difficult um, topic. Um, but if you see something you like, something you're interested to, do get in touch and help us out in round two. Um, so as we get started, a caveat. All actuaries should make caveats. Um, should actuaries be economists? Well, the economy is a complex, adaptive, dynamical, real-world system. Uh, as an actuary, you'd like to be able to represent the economy as a cash flow system with rules. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. Um, the problem is, the flows are uncertain or, or unknown. The rules are uncertain or unknown. The constraints are uncertain or unknown. And the players are adaptive. And sometimes the players even change the rules. It's a lot more complicated than a life insurance policy. There's enough information, misinformation, fake news, and opinion to be able to develop and support kind of any viewpoint you want. You know, on, on every issue there are 10 viewpoints, and they're not all wrong, and they're not all right, but it's difficult to tell who, who is right. So it's a question of, you know, is it correct? Is it likely accurate? Is it likely not incorrect? Um, and for those of us who follow the actuaries code, all of us, um, it raises an issue. You know, any communication should be accurate and not misleading. But the complex interconnected nature of the areas of uncertainty in economics make it improbable to communicate the potential effects thereof in an accurate and not misleading way. Right? Because after all is said and done, there's a very high likelihood that retrospectively it will have been incorrect. And before we get to the actual discussion on NERP, which will be later, but I uh, have a bit of a preface to NERP. Um, it's important to understand the global economy as a system and the relationships among wealth, money, and currency and the options we might consider in times of emergency, you know, QE, uh, open market operations, though those are, those are just kind of normal times things. Um, NERP, price targeting, the elimination of physical cash, uh, stock exchange closers, asset freezes, and the list goes on. All these horror stories that you, see, you hear in, in, in the media or in, in books like James Rickards or the alt media. Um, And you can't understand the mechanics of the US dollar looking at the USA in isolation. On the flip side, you can't understand the mechanics of another nation's economy without considering the effects and interrelationships with the US dollar. So the question is, well, why am I mentioning the US dollar? 
First, uh, US dollar is de facto reserve currency, um, mostly across the world, and some people think that's in jeopardy. I don't know if it is, but some people think it is, and so a lot of people don't think it is. Um, second, you know, why is the US pushing for a cashless world? Why are governments across the world pushing to remove cash? Why are big multinationals pushing to remove cash? Third, although it's an impossible problem, if you understood all of the problems, risk, constraints, and issues related to physical cash and to electronic cash, then you might be able to understand the impetus behind the push to remove cash. Um, and that's why we should view it as a system, and the US dollar is a big part of this. Banks and debt are central to the economy. With positive nominal interest rates, one plus the interest rate, well, this is very average, very general, but one plus R is needed for all borrowers to repay all loans next year. If it's not there, then somebody has to default. So where does this money come from? Well, it comes from other borrowers. Um, so does stability equal stable nominal profit, equal a gradual increase in the money supply? But on the flip side, with negative nominal interest rates, one minus R is needed for all borrowers to repay loans, all loans next year. So where does the money go? Does it go to other borrowers? You know, we're not used to and not comfortable with the destruction or the deletion of money. You know, we're very used to the creation of money via debt and loans and such, and the cancellation thereof as it's repaid, but to have money canceled seems very counterintuitive or impossible. Um, so in the case of nom uh, negative nominal interest rates, does stability equal nominal profit equal a gradual decrease in the money supply? And if it does, we've, we've missed something. Um, but I don't know what that something is. And finally, the discussion on NERP, which is something I hope that you'll join us for. I, I don't pretend to be able to do a discussion on NERP in two minutes, um, but some things we might consider. First, banks and debt are central to the economy. Banking jargon restricts the resolution of banking problems to bankers. NERP, is it a boon to borrowers and a burden to savers? Banks and life insurers, oh, sorry, banks on one side, Life insurers and pension schemes, on the other hand, uh, they're on opposite ends of the maturity transformation. Likewise, well, similarly, um, in terms of leverage, life insurers and pension schemes are on the unleveraged end of the spectrum, if you look at who's playing in the market. Um, well, it's a good thing if you're a very long-term player. High, you know, large amounts of leverage over the very long term will get you in trouble. Um, the banks seem to get a lot of help from central banks. The question is, is banking hard? Um, and the help that banks ha have, have gotten over the past, well, since the financial crisis, um, seems to have come at a cost to long-term savings and pensions and long-term uh, insurance products. Then macroeconomic risk. On versus off balance sheet. Is macro... You know, risk, risk itself doesn't disappear. So is mass, macro risk increasing or decreasing? Is that reflected in aggregate balance sheets? If not, where is it escaping to? You know, where is it accumulating? Kind of like the subprime crisis. That's where that accumulated. You know, is risk growing today <clears throat> unnecessarily? And if so, where is it hiding? Negative interest rates, reinvestment, and long-term investment in insurance products. Are they less viable today than they have been in the past? Is NERP here to stay? Is it avoidable? Is it unavoidable? So, those are just some ideas for our discussion on NERP, and I hope you all pitch in, even though NERP is just a, just a, tiny, a tiny part of the whole cashless um, paper, the whole, all the considerations around going cashless. Thank you, Sam. That's it for me. Our third and final speaker 
this evening in, in the sessional presentation is Sabrina Roachmond. Sabrina works for a global organisation in the UK as an IT service management consultant. She's a specialist in service transition with interest in cloud computing, project management, business and economics. She joined the working party in January of last year. Good evening. Throughout 2017, we closely followed the uh, international news on the cashless society. The result is a chronicle of events that were called uh, cashless world in motion. Um, the second semester of 2017 will soon be available as an addendum on the working party website. So look out for this. So what are the key takeaways? The speed of uptake in new payment technology seems closely related to the unmet demand in financial services. In developed countries, we see a gradual rise in cashless transactions. Um, but contactless payments seem to be eating away at the low value transactions, the ground normally of cash takes. Um, we may be walking into, sleepwalking into cashless society, but are we excluding the vulnerable in the process? That's a question for our group here. Ten years ago, M-Pesa kicked off a revolution in Africa and surrounding countries where most people are unbanked. Ten years on, the level of um, ecosystem moves have been absolutely breathtaking. And that would be worthy of a separate presentation, but tonight we'll focus on the Asia-Pacific region. Here you see um, an overall picture with different levels of development towards trans uh, cashless transactions in Asia-Pacific. Now, in addition, we've noted some, um, some activity in um, some additional countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Also, Cambodia would deserve its own study because it's just celebrated nine year anniversary of a launch of its own mobile banking provider. So it'd be good to see the results there. Amongst these countries, a study has classified Australia and New Zealand uh, in the leader group of the most digitally advanced countries, i.e. the countries where you're least likely to use cash. Um, closely behind some other countries like China, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam um, are seem to, seem to be actively moving towards a cashless society, albeit with really different timescales. Some of these prefer uh, mobile payments such as China, Malaysia um, and South Korea but others, uh, such as Australia, Japan, and the Philippines, are um, very closely um, in preference of card payments. Regardless of the payment technology that's preferred, um, there's a, a common theme across the region in that um, the, the cost of ca uh, cashless transactions um, is such a concern that some countries are actively working to reduce this, and some, such as India, actually subsidizing low-value low transactions now, uh, which is a, a breakthrough to sustain um, the level of rise. Speaking of which, 8th of November 2016, India um, announced the demonetization of two key banknotes in the country, that led to immediate confusion and um, uh, total disruption of usual economic activities. 1st of July, uh, it implemented, and that was uh, planned implementation, it implemented the goods and services tax, which is equivalent to our VAT. So a year on, how is India faring? Well, it all depends on your perspective, really, because there is, um, remaining objective of uh, the emotive, biased, uh, strong content um, from news on India is particularly um, challenging. So 
we have uh, we have attempted to to provide you with a bit of an overview. You'll find the details of this in the addendum in uh, six categories. But the story goes as supporters hail the move as a strategic structural change that was rec really required in the economy, um, an economy that really needed formalizing with an increase of um, the tax base. Um, all of these changes are required for the long term. Now, it is knowledge that negative impact uh, was, was quite impressive. However, some uh, benefits already materializing such as more sustainable inflation rates, uh, dropping lending rates, an increase of um, qualified technology jobs, uh, so following the investments in a biometric system at the Adar card and the United Payments uh, interface. What we see is um, an uptake uh, in the use of banking facilities um, that is also enabling not only financial inclusion in pure sense, but also the cascade of and the better use of social funds, and that's quite a, an interesting aspect of the change. Now, the move was popular at home and abroad, but it certainly wasn't popular with the criminal class, and um, that was uh, one of the key points, one of the key reasons for a surprise announcement on that night on November the 8th, uh, as it severely disrupted uh, criminal activities such as uh, counterfeiting, terrorism, and money laundering. Um, so that was a, a key point, which um, is also uh, a pain point for detractors. Um, opponents are very upset by the lack of consultation and engagement, not only for the decision, but also for the implementation um, and how the economy was handled following the, the announcement. Um, it was it continued remaining a, a one-sided uh, um, decision-making process. The, uh, the, the key criticism is around the liquidity crisis that ensued, and um, that led to major social disruption. Uh, loads of jobs, uh, people confused, especially in rural areas. Months on, the decision is still viewed as a failure as some figures um, put forward that the level of cash transaction the same level broadly as before demonetization, um, especially in rural areas where lacking infrastructure just doesn't enable such an uptake. So more work to do here. Um, and the detractors also doubt on the long-term benefits um, clearly not quite seeing the long-term aspects, especially around the claims on um, criminal, uh, on, on um, the fight against crime and uh, money laundering and, and corruption. Security is also um, an issue because of the, uh, the level and the impact of cyber attacks. Um, so overall, there's a doubt of the results right now. We don't have enough hindsight yet, possibly because there's, a la there's insufficient level of uh, economic figures yet available, and many can be um, disputed or um, counteracted. So we learned a great deal about the cashless society in 2017, spurred on by Mediatek events in India. We also discovered some initiatives that may be relevant, appropriate, up for discussion in countries such as the UK. Um, so some examples include um, uh, some payment system in, uh, from Africa and also the, welf the cashless welfare cards from Australia. And some earlier initiatives that were taken up um, in, in Sweden that recently was implemented in France um, to counter VAT fraud uh, at cash registers. Thank you for your time and interest. Thank you. Th th thank you, Sabrina. So, before we begin the discussion and debate part of this evening's sessional event, we will have some opening remarks from Parrot Jack Ria. So, I'm delighted to introduce the next speaker, which is our opener for this evening, Parrot Jack Ria. Parrot is responsible for long-term investment strategy at 
Prudential Portfolio Management Group, which includes strategic asset allocation for a number of multi-asset funds, long-term investment and hedging strategy, and providing advice on ALM strategy. He is also responsible for providing long-term economic views to Prudential Group, as well as the development and maintenance of Prudential's in-house stochastic assumption system. Parrot joined Prudential Portfolio Management Group in 2007 as Director of Quantitative Research and has team responsibilities have evolved to include strategic asset allocation, capital market assumptions and hedging strategies. In 2014, Parrot was appointed the head of the newly formed long-term investment strategy function. Prior to joining PPMG, Parrot undertook a variety of roles within the Prudential Group across risk, capital finance, statistical modelling and research. He is a fellow of the Institute, Institute and Faculty of Actuaries as well as the CFA charter holder. He is an active member of numerous, he has been an active member of numerous working parties for the actuarial profession, inclu including chairing the Extreme Events Working Party and has contributed on a number of papers, articles and presentations for the actuarial profession. He's a member of the Finance and Investment Board and Chair of the Finance and Investment Research Subcommittee. So please welcome Parrot Jack Ria. Oh, thanks, Kervin. My, uh, my uh, opening uh, statement was well, perhaps uh, shorter than the introduction you've just given, uh, kindly. Um, but thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you very much to all the authors. It's, it's, it's an excellent paper, and having read it more than once, it was a, it was a really, really good read. Um, I must say uh, also this is an opportune time in kind of having the discussion in an open forum because, as you said, this is, this is just phase, uh, prior to phase two of the research, and hence any, any questions you have on the floor, there's, there's a good chance they, they fall into, into the research streams. Um, uh, it, it is, um, as was mentioned earlier, it, it's going to be difficult to try and summarize the key features of the paper in a very short time. I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you some of the, the key points and takeaways I, I got from reading it. Um, I, I think, um, firstly, uh, kind of in the world we live in today, we have uh, a, a series of developments which you would not have imagined maybe 10, 15 years ago. And, and the foremost in my mind is uh, interest rates, and in particular negative interest rates. Uh, so we're, we're in an economics kind of theory textbooks. You are you are kind of you are taught to believe that uh, positive interest rates are a must-have uh, in order to incentivize the deferral of consumption. So as human beings, we have a choice whether we uh, we consume now or, or we wait and and save to consume for the future on the basis that there will be more items in the future. Um, clearly that's been turned on its head and uh, one factor, although not directly linked to cashless society, is, is very much indirectly linked in, in terms of the uh, cash, the uh, kind of predominance of cashless society making uh, negative interest rates even more possible. So that, that's certainly going to be one of my questions for phase two. Um, and, 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 and all the work that was done initially on the negative interest rate policy, I, I found that fascinating, personally. Um, in terms of the paper itself, I'd, I'd very much recommend reading, um, if, if you have a choice of sections, the, the costs and benefits of, of being a cashless society, as well as the, the global kind of case studies of, of various areas. The, the costs and benefits in particular were, were staggering. I, I had not expected such a large proportion of GDP to be a, a cost of a cashless society. I, I suspect it's, it's different in different economies and, and perhaps one area for future travel might be um, looking at the, the costs of uh, the costs of cashless society as well. So with, I think within Within the UK, small businesses need to pay uh, up to a 2% kind of transaction fee for all major card providers, which, which currently incentivizes them to accept cash payments rather than card payments. Are, are we perversely behind some of the, the fascinating case studies we saw in, in Africa, so in particular Kenya and South Africa, 
where uh, where the uh, kind of prevailing banking and finance systems have gotten a two to three generation boost to go go straight into mobile banking with the uh, invention and and adoption of, of M-Pesa straight away. Um, the, the other fascinating thing in the paper was the global perspective and the case studies of how different different economies are are, are going in the direction of, of cashless. So the big uh, big and public debate on the demonetization in India, and that that was very fascinating to hear your take on it. Uh, the recent trends in Asia, in particular the move towards uh, re online retail, that, that looks like a big factor in the, in the adoption of cashless. And, and on the flip side, I, I feel that there may be some other areas, uh, for example Japan, where um, there, there, there seems to be a slightly different direction, which, which is not quite cashless, so that, that's certainly worth, worth investigating. Um, other than that, I, I wanted to uh, to give an uh, opening question to to the, to the speakers, um, and it is it is one that I really couldn't quite get my head around, uh, and which was what I alluded to at the start. It was um, if if cashless society increases the chances of negative interest rates, what, what do negative interest rates mean to the economics of society? How, how do you consider consumption? And, and deferral of consumption in a world where there's negative interest rates as a as a consumer. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> as as with all, I think a lot of the questions on urban economics, it's a very difficult question. Um, I think the main hurdle in respect of that is the nominal zero of P&L. Uh, you can't make a profit if everyone's making a loss. If it's at zero, even if the whole world is shrinking, you know, say that we can't, we, we're at a point where productivity is decreasing or something, or output is decreasing, GDP is decreasing, then on average, everyone will be making a loss. But the nominal zero of the, uh, of the P&L um, well, everyone is making a loss, so if you could index that, <laughs> which seems very odd, um, then you'd have, you know, profits relative to a negative number, which might address that issue of not um, deferring consumption, as you said. That's only one aspect. I'm sure there are other equally valid and better responses to that. Thank you very much. And I guess we'd be delighted to open open the floor to questions. So can I just remind everyone that, so anyone who wishes to speak, if you could please um, raise your hand and then if we have a roaming mic as well and if you could wait for, for the roaming mic. So, so with that we will open it to the floor for questions. So is there anyone who would like to offer a thought or a first question, yes, gentlemen, gentlemen here. Hello, yes, okay. I'd like to thank the authors and other contributors to this paper for, for the information they have managed to bring together. However, I'm not sure I come out with much wiser as a consequence. There seem to be far too many anomalies for this thing to make sense. In the conclusion sections, the authors appear to have re resigned themselves to the idea that we will move to a so-called cashless world. I believe that in public, sorry, I believe that in the public interest, the actual profession should seek to contribute to the debate rather than document and help manage the implementation. Of course, I can understand wider issues may not have been within the scope of the working party, but perhaps the Finance and Investment Board might like to consider the scope again after taking into account discussions at this meeting. I think the most important word in this paper is in its title, and that is society. My interpretation of this is that we all collectively have an interest in how much money, and specifically in this case so-called cash, is organised. Cash and society are closely linked, and it is cash which enabled the world many of us now take for granted. 
playing with this cash could be dangerous. Obviously, there are many forms of political structure which allow individuals to have a voice, but I believe that there has to be an explicit choice. I, I dislike the idea that society could be considered to have accepted something because it is made convenient for them to change their habits. Um, I would have rather liked some of the comments in the slides to have got into the paper. One of my key issues was we are talking about a society without notes and coins, which I think is a very important point. I believe that actually a lot of your anomalies would be solved if you realised that actually we are talking about alternative forms of cash. Obviously, it requires us to actually consider a different use for the term cash, although I'm not entirely sure there is actually a standard. Um, sorry, I've now got a bit off my prepared notes. Um, I believe the reasons people are adopting digital alternatives is that they see them as cash. And some of them, in fact, are cash. M-Pesa just appears to me, and I may have got it wrong, to be a system which actually increased the velocity of circulation of cash. And that, in a country which had possibly a lot of surplus labor willing to work, has probably caused the growth. So I think a lot of the problems, you're, a lot of the anomalies you see are because there are different reasons. There is no one thing for digital cash, which I think you highlighted in one of the sections. I believe it might have been a reasonable start to actually have designed, specified a monetary system. We are only talking about cash here. Um, and I, I believe we need to start and say what cash is, and I think it is an, a, a way of transacting immediately or near instantaneously. Um, and as we have seen, all modern technology is perhaps even faster than cash uh, and perhaps more efficient, but it is still, I believe, worth the term cash. But I believe also that as long as there are, is, an, is an equivalence and equality, equality between each alternative's value, there is no reason why there shouldn't be multiple variations of cash type existing in the same system at the time. And in all honesty, I believe that cash keeps the system safe. And there may be a reason for, on which even a cost of 3% might well be necessary to keep the system safe. You, in the paper, you do pick up an awful lot of points, but don't seem to bring them together. One of the things that comes out a lot is trust, um, which actually I think is, is the most important thing. But I also believe that actually people probably will trust more if they believe and they own the system. As I've said before, actually that we have to consider this, we have to consider a whole system. It seems to me there are at least two other conceptual entities we have to define. And I'm going to use the terms currency and money. I would define money as a set of job objects which can be relatively easily turned into cash with a reasonable expectation of, of, of value. I believe then currency is actually the mechanism by which a society manages money. It is only at this level that trust can truly be established. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that, tr that, that, that there is much trust at the moment. Regrettably, I don't think that the arguments made by politicians and regulators that nobody else saw it coming, so I am not to blame, goes down too well. Trust would be further eroded if new tools like negative interest rates are, are asked for rather than regulators and governments managing risk in the first place. And perhaps ask yourselves, what will happen if the new type or types of cash go wrong and politicians and regulators again say it looked like a good idea at the time? I'm quite sure there are enough good ideas in this paper to enable the essential characteristics of each of these objects I believe should be defined 
to be, to be actually created. I now must actually admit that the reason I'm contributing here is, and my motivation for speaking tonight is, is my belief that Bitcoin is a serious threat to society and the monetary system. That is not to say blockchain might not be useful, but only as a ledger system that there are now suggestions of the high costs in terms of resources to implement it. The inherent flaws in Bitcoin is the finite limit on the number of coins in issue. This makes it totally unacceptable as a currency where to actually match production of the economy, you have to change the amount of money, which is actually highlighted in the paper. Sorry, while I generally agree that the authors have tried to be impartial, I do have some serious concerns about the linkage of a cashless society to issues like immigration without first asking if there is an alternative or more appropriate solution. And you'll all be quite happy. This is now my last thought. I would like to make one final point for now. I do note a general concentration on the primacy of money, especially when considering a store of value. In the paper, of course, negative interest rate policies appear to invalidate that. And I think the confidence of the financial system will suffer. Though at one stage there was an attempt to introduce a concept of wealth being somewhat different to money, ultimately I do not perceive any store of wealth in money or other financial analysis is actually permanent. There is actually no worthwhile value without work or the ability to control work of others. Whatever we do to money, currency or cash, the only important question is what does it do to the amount of work done? Thank you. I'm not sure if there's anyone of the working party who would like to perhaps make one or two comments on that. Um, uh, I didn't catch the gentleman's name, actually. Sorry, actually, could, could the gentleman give, give his name? We never caught that at the start. Thank you. Bob Olson. Mr. Olson, yeah, thank you for your contribution. Um, I, I have to confess that um, the PA system, um, as you can see from the speakers, works towards you, and I didn't pick up everything that you said, so please forgive me, and um, I'm, I'm happy to have a chat afterwards. Um, it struck me that, um, I, I'm, I may not have you correct, but I think that there's a small confusion about the definition of cash and money, and that's why we've taken the simplest possible um, definition of cash as being notes and coins. It's not to replace money. And um, you're, you're, I, I think you picked up about cash being the most stable form of, uh, or, or the best form of stability within an economy. And um, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you for the sheer difficulty of transportation and handling cash and the desire by people in the economy, it's quite clear when you go to, uh, in the morning to, to pay for your coffee, most people are paying contactless or cards without actually having the cash um, in their pocket and transferring it. People are moving towards it and whether it's the most stable or not the most stable, I think it's inevitable that we are, around the world, moving to a decashing situation. Now, in some economies, as you've probably read from the paper, um, this is a huge advantage. So we, we make a, uh, a case study of M-Pesa in, in Kenya. And you may have picked up that M stands for money, or mobile, um, Pesa is Swahili for money. And just the sheer fact that um, where there's no internet, um, there's not very much in the way of banking system and people having to transport very large sums of money um, from um, from, from um, urban areas to rural uh, places, which is difficult, expensive, um, hazardous, what moving and, re and not using cash but using mobile forms of payment has just totally revolutionised the economy there. I'm not suggesting it's revolutionised the economy here in the UK, 
Um, but I, I think that, or in, certainly in the Western world, and that's why the answer and the desire is different by different economies on different state of development, and also, um, uh, as I said, with different um, stakeholder groups. Um, I will just pick up one thing, if I might do, with Parrot, um, and he talked about, I think he talked about, was it you or, or, or so yourself about Japan, you mentioned it, um, we, we, we find it very interesting that countries like Sweden, um, you almost find it difficult at the moment to go in and spend your krona in, in shops. And I've read about it, I didn't believe it, but I've spoken to so many Swedes who tell me just that, that it's very difficult to spend Swedish krona in shops. People don't take it, and, and their attitude is almost, well, why would I? But other countries, such as Japan, may be. But Germany is very interesting. Germany is way behind some of the other countries in the, in the um, Western world. And, and you have to ask yourself, why might that be? And I can't tell you the answer about that. The only thing that worries me is I picked up on um, one of the risks that we have on a totalitarian government, that you might be worried that all of a sudden the government knows absolutely every movement that you make if you have everything done by electronic transfer. And it's possible, and I'm not saying it is the case, that a lot of Germans have in the past either not lived under but remember a rather totalitarian society, or even those that have lived in the GDR understand and know it as well, and might themselves be um, uh, rejecting the use of cash, uh, sorry, the use of electronic payments in lieu of cash for that reason. Okay, yes, if we could have the mic to the gentleman there again. Could I just try and explain what I understand by M-Pesa? It appears to me that it is actually a system which transfers credits on phones. And I, be, I assume that those credits actually have to be paid for in cash. There doesn't appear to be another version of cash in the system. And as such, the entry and exit points are cash, and M-Pesa is not a currency system. It is a method of transmission. Yes, that method of transmission reduces costs, but there is still a, it is still actually reliant on cash. There are other forms like digital, other forms like that actually tend not to do it that way. But unless you understand the differences between the systems, I think you will not explain your anomalies. Yes, sir. Uh, you're quite right. M-Pesa is not a new currency. And we're not talking about new currencies, but it's replacing the use of cash in the transference of the money from physical money to electronic money. Okay, can we, would anyone else like to ask a question? Yes, the, the gentleman here in the second row. Thank you. John Spain, on slide six or seven, I'm not sure which, it was during Ian's um, part of it, and it was about the totalitarian. I can't quite remember the word. It might have been illiberal totalitarian, and that would be the case, which you just mentioned again, about where people would be scared about moving away from cash. I find it hard to believe that there is such a thing as a liberal totalitarian state anywhere in the world that could ever be. Secondly, we are actually there. We're not in a totalitarian state, but certain people do have their banking facilities circumscribed, quite violently sometimes. You are no longer wanted as our client. Go away. You have a problem? Sorry about that. We cannot tell you why. And third, Apple Pay, Google Pay, are these not new totalitarian outfits? Um, I, I don't know how to respond to that, but um, thank you. I, I, uh, it's very interesting with all the developments and different uh, payment intermediaries, basically. Um, brings back one of the points that Mr. Olson said in the cost of cash, whereas the cost of physical cash is quite massive. Um, those costs are in transport and storage and updating machines and such, so those costs probably go back into the economy. But if you have uh, Apple Pay, Google Pay, 
or if you're in a small country and the payment processor is a company from another country, if 2% of every payment goes to the payment processor, you know, after 10 years, you're going to have, what, 90, 98% to the 10th power of the amount of money you had before. So it's very interesting, worrying, um, yeah, and that's, that could be where we're going. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call Apple Pay, Google Pay, totalitarian um, without my tongue in my cheek. Uh, but thank you. Yes, sir. Our next question here is the gentleman in the front row. Thank you very much. Um, I thought it was very helpful and lots of food for thought. Thank you for giving up your time to do this. Um, you pick up on society, um, and I think the impact on society is really important. You pick up financial exclusion, big brother watching. But what about the disconnect people have with money, I think is really important. Let me give you an example. When I was young, I used to go out with £50, and once it was spent, it was spent. If I had a really good night, I used to walk home, and if it wasn't as good night, I'd get a taxi home. But today, people can just spend and spend and spend, and it's the same thing with gambling, internet shopping. What level of research have you done in that area? Okay, so... Um... <laughs> Yes, um, you, I, I don't know if you, you picked up on, on the paper, but there's a, a very interesting exercise going on in certain boroughs in certain states in Australia where uh, benefit cards are not, get, or benefit is not handed out by cash, but by, uh, by a reloadable debit card. And the idea very much is that someone on benefits, for example, cannot spend the cash because of the barcodes or QR codes or something like that on alcohol, on gaming, and then presumably on drugs as well. Um, and although there are ways around it, and there's big debate going on in Australia about whether or not this is actually working, I think there's sufficient um, evidence to believe that the federal government there is looking to roll that out. In, um, in Jordan, which, uh, this is not mentioned in the newspaper, in, in our paper, in Jordan, where there is, we, we don't associate Jordan necessarily as being particularly high tech, but Syrian refugees who are being looked after by different United Nations agencies are being, are having their benefits paid, not in cash at all, but using a blockchain um, facility at stores. And um, there's no doubt about it that um, uh, at least electronic payments of sorts do give you a, a way of controlling certain aspects of, uh, of expenditure. My grandson, for example, he's nine years old, he has a Go Henry card. Now, we do mention Go Henry in the, uh, in the paper, and it's quite simple. He gets his car, he gets his pocket money now paid directly onto his card. I think there are problems, and I've written to Go Henry about it, that he can't read. Um, how much money he's got on his card, um, he, he needs a little card reader, but he does have a, uh, a mobile device and he can log into it and he can find out how much money. Um, my son is able to control his spending, the amount he spends at any one moment of time, and what he spends it on. So he can't go and, and buy dodgy videos, or uh, I don't suppose uh, they exist anymore, or, um, which is what my son did. But the... Um, <laughs> Or, 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 uh, or magazines from the top, st of top shelf, that sort of thing. But he can control what he's spending his money on. Does, does that help? Any more questions? And if I could remind everyone to, if you could please state your name before you, you ask your question. Yes, the gentleman here in the second row. Uh, hi, uh, Sean McCarthy is my name. Um, just, uh, no, I must confess I haven't read the paper, but um, with regard to the impact on something like QE, if you did have a cash society, would it kind of move away from central banks buying, you know, bonds and, and, and things like that and move to, because that's not very effective if you're trying to boost consumption, as we've seen. It just creates asset price inflation. Have you looked at kind of ways that that could be done more effectively? Is, is that something, Sam, you, you would like to 
respond on? Sure. I wish I were a central banker, but then we'd be in a lot more trouble. Um, I don't have a good answer to your question. I think it's something worth looking at. Um, I think QE is very complex. Um, you can read all about it. There's lots of different, um, you know, what you'd consider facts or data and lots of different interpretations. Um, and whether it was good or not, I, I don't know. Maybe. We're still here. The banking system is still intact, for better or worse. Um, I think if, if QE had not happened, the world would be quite different. Um, the financial services might be quite different. There's, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, you talk about QE, but the opposite can also be true. But the, um, let, let's assume, for example, that the Bank of England were to issue, not bank, any central bank, and it's going to happen in my mind. I don't know if the Bank of England will be amongst the first tier of operators, but my guess is there will be a central bank digital currency in due course, and that may not be too far away. So, um, let, 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 before I go on, let's just think about that loan. Do you remember we were talking about the £20 note in your pocket being a loan um, by the bank, or a loan to the Bank of England, uh, I promised to pay the bearer, or the £20 that you've got deposited at HSBC is a loan to a trust trusted borrower, HSBC, I have to ask yourself, if you own Bitcoin, who have you lent your money to? And the answer is you haven't a clue who you've lent your money to. But if the Bank of England introduced a cryptocurrency, a blockchain um, type currency, a digital currency, you know exactly who you've lent your, your, your money to. And because the Bank of England now has all the accounts, what it does and sub accounts to different clearing banks or not, I have no idea. That's something which we'll look at in phase two. Uh, but he could drop, the Bank of England can just drop money into your accounts. So QE would look very different. But the opposite would be true in negative interest rate policy, that if it wanted to take money out of, out of your account in terms of negative interest rate, it just sucks it out as well. That could all happen in a, in, in a cashless society. It would still be sterling. It's just a different way of handling it, if it were the UK, or it could be from any other currency. So, so the idea of a central bank digital currency, which the Bank of England, they've looked at a proof of concept. We don't know exactly what their answer is and what their, their reaction is. My guess is they won't want to be the first, necessarily, to, to put their toes in the water. But they're going to be digital cur um, currencies by central banks somewhere around the world in the not too distant future. I've no proof of that to you, but it's my guess. I think you, you might be talking about uh, helicopter money, effectively. Yeah. That's uh, I was, that, this would allow something different to helicopter money, basically. Yes, yeah, so, uh, a different way, way to, to implement yeah. heli helicopter money. Um, and it, I guess so the question would be: Will helicopter money? stimulate the economy, or will it just feed inflation? Um, I mean, and you probably have to couple helicopter money with uh, other kinds of economic policies to ensure that um, it, you know, it spurred growth and didn't just add money to a fixed set of goods. Okay. Our next question to the gentleman with the blue tie over here, please. Uh, my name is Martin Barringer. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, uh, I mean, have great admiration for the work that's been done in collating such a tremendous amount of information. Um, obviously, a lot of work has gone in. Um, and I do note that there is going to be a phase two, but the, the tremendous volume of information, although it's collated, we seem to see very little in the way of even tentative conclusions at the moment. So I look forward to phase two when that will um, be developed more. Uh, I'd like to say um, I f first visited Kenya about 10 years ago, slightly more than 10 years ago, and I was amazed to come across this system we now have discussed, uh, and it's called M-Pesa, where people could pay each other using their mobile phones. I'd never seen anything like this before, and my reaction is, why haven't we got this in the UK? And um, uh, what's more, I asked some more questions, and I found that people didn't even need a bank account. 
All they had to do was go to an agent, get the money put on their phone, they could send it up country, as you say, to perhaps their relatives in the, the, the provinces. And this replaced, as you indicated, a, a system which was very much more risky in the past where you just had to give the cash to a trusted agent. Um, and what surprised me was that not only was it uh, a, uh, a very advanced system which we don't seem to have in the UK even now because um, you didn't need a bank account, but as far as I'm aware, one needs a bank account to link up to all the, um, co uh, the uh, non-money, uh, non-cash transmissions. Um, and it seems that this was a, the regulatory system in Kenya allowed the telecoms company, um, Safaricom, uh, to uh, uh, effectively uh, allow these transmissions uh, without having a link with the banking system. Now, this is obviously a regulatory issue, and I wonder, is the regulatory issue uh, preventing other uh, transmission mechanisms developing in this country and other advanced payment economies uh, because um, uh, they, they have to be linked to a bank account and they, uh, as a means of control? Uh, it's a smashing question, and um, thank you for that. Um, the M-Pesa system, which is what's so beautiful about it, is because most areas in Kenya do not have Wi-Fi or internet access. So the people are using M-Pesa on the sort of mobile telephones that we think are Jurassic and are probably rolled out for about $10 a piece. And this is something which is akin to the device, the security device that your bank gives you for free so that you can do some internet banking. And here it is a different situation. Um, I, 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 I don't know what would stop it if there is a regulatory reason why um, we, we can't exchange money on our mobile telephones. I think we do to an extent already when you see um, charity um, type adverts and text save to a certain number and five pounds gets debited from your um, mobile telephone account and five pound gets credited to theirs. So I think it does happen to an extent. I'm, I do believe um, Safari Common Pesa is regulated. The money is not, it's not a loan to Safari Com, unlike a loan to HSBC or Barclays. It's money held by Safari Com and they, they're, they're, then they have, their money is then held by a third party. And if Safari Com were to go bust, that the money is, is not affected. I will move on to the next question because I know there, there are a number of, of people who, who would still like to raise their questions. So the gentleman here in the red tie, please. Hi, Tim Burse. Just to pick up two points, one from Ian. Um, yes, five pounds you put on your mobile fine and the charity gets five pounds if it's a big charity which is advertising on television. If you're a local charity and you set up these arrangements, five pounds put on your phone gets the charity about four pounds and five pence and the rest of the money the telecoms companies suck up. Um, and they don't necessarily make that abundantly clear. Um, and to pick up Martin's point, the biggest single sector that continues to use checks, if you remember what they are, is the charity sector. The Charity Commission gives very clear steers that payments out from charities need to authorise those. So a check is the obvious it's a CAF bank, have a very good tool authorised system for electronic banking. The other clearers are just beginning to catch up, but payments made over the counter to a retailer seem to be a non-starter in anybody's system. Um, you know, um, if if one one regulator is saying two signatures are needed, another regulator is pushing for electronic banking. I think these people have got to get their act together. Yes, I'll just have one comment from Parrot. Yes, there's, there's quite a lot of discussion on um, MPES, and I just want to say I, I had the uh, had the good fortune of being born and brought up in Kenya, and I, I, I think some of the questions asked um, 
uh, asked uh, effectively well, why did it become so prevalent? Why, why was there a spark in Kenya? And, and I think it's worth just touch, touching a little bit on um, the, the general of geography, geography of Kenya. Kenya is, um, Kenya is relatively large in, in terms of landmass. It's, it's about uh, 800 kilometers across and 800 kilometers long. And there's a lot of terrain. There's, there's mountains, there's deserts. There's, there's a lot of very, very difficult terrain in there. So if you, if you think of the, the evolution of banking, uh, when, I, when I left, left Kenya kind of to, to come here about 20 years ago, there was an intention to roll out bank branches across the country, but even that was difficult, so not even every village had its own local bank branch. Uh, that, so if you think of that as kind of first generation banking, the next generation, which, which it never quite saw, was telephone banking, where you have telephone lines connecting the entire country. So it managed to jump three generations, because it went straight to mobile banking, um, all you needed was a mobile phone and 2G, 2G internet. And, and the biggest reason it succeeded was that it helped, it helped businesses, it helped uh, repatriation of, of money across um, diff different parts of units. So there's, there's, there's a lot of migration in terms of uh, working within Kenya from rural, rural to city areas. So it allowed repatriation back to the rural, rural areas. And, um, and that, that, I think, was the single biggest reason it, it kind of blew up in use. Um, in terms of the licensing, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is, it's actually, it's denominated in Kenyan shillings, so it's the same currency. There's no change to the currency. The, the telecoms uh, got in quite quickly, and they managed to have a deal with the regulator. And it's very interesting. So, so now the banks in Kenya are, are applying for a telecoms license because they feel they are behind the curve and they've been disrupted by, by telecoms. So it, it's, it's actually a case of a disruptive technology. Are there any further questions? Yeah, the gentleman in the front row. Hi there, I'm Richard Galbraith. Uh, it, it's very related point, and it, it might be, yes, 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 that's, that's linked up. It's a very interesting paper, thank you. What I was going to talk about is, I'm wondering if this is starting to change the definition of money. I'm not saying cash, because at the moment, as long as we've got a cashless society, we're talking about going in, uh, waving our contactless, using our Apple Pay, Google Pay, whatever it might be, but there's the next level of transactionless payment. And I'm wondering if that's the point things start to change, because as soon as you move into the blockchain, as we said, potentially you could remove out the old-fashioned banking sector, People go out on their night out. You, you don't need to carry cash. You don't need a card. You've got <clears throat> potentially facial recognition or something else. You don't even need to think about it anymore. And I'm just wondering if that changes the definition again from the just, we're talking about cashless, but we're almost out of date already. Yes, um, thanks, Richard. In, in fact, the point I should have made about our friends in Jordan is that the payments are made by eye recognition. And this is in Jordan. Hardly... Um, Silicon Valley. It's uh, and 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 so yes, maybe that's going to happen. We just go there, thumbprints, um, or we have thumbprints to an extent on Apple Pay, don't we? Um, I recognition. Yes, I mean, why not? Um, it's just a form of transferring one's assets from someone to somebody else, but not using a bit of chem but not using paper or physical money. So maybe we have time for two further questions. Yes, that. Hi, I'm Louisa Lobo. Um, just a quick point. Um, thank you for the paper. It is very thorough. Um, in terms of structure, do you think, given where we're at with the wider debate on cryptocurrency and different forms of money, it might be better to structure it as one part being about blockchain and distributed ledger frameworks that exist or are available, and then an alternative structure for the store of value, which seems to be the other kind of part of the, the equation, really, in, in terms of, it, it, it just seems like the paper does touch on, you know, issues like immigration, political, banking, all, you know, all elements of the economy, all elements of our lives, and it feels like, you know, going back to things of the axiom, axioms of what is good money kind of helps us to organise our thinking. Yes, thank, thank you for that. And, and indeed, um, I, I, do you know, when we um, started on this paper, I think we were um, looking mainly at, at the benefits of, of taking 
cash, notes and coin out of society. And then we discovered that it was just so much more. We, hence, hence phase two is coming um, to a cinema near you quickly, I think. I think that you found, for those of you that have read the paper, it's, it's, yes, it's quite lengthy, um, over 40,000 words, but it's a, on balance, it's an easy read. And, and I do recommend it for you. I, I think it's an easy read and, and well worth going. We've written a, a little bit about a lot of different subjects, and we discovered that some of those subjects needed a vast amount more rigor. Um, blockchain technology is one of them. And certainly looking at, we've already hinted at um, uh, at changing capital markets, for example, at changing the eco-banking system. These are not necessarily involved a, a, a cash of society. We have veered off, but there's no doubt about it that if cash were withdrawn from society, there will be some people who demand the use of cash for whatever reason, and it might be for not for the right reasons, but it might be for perfectly genuine reasons. Um, they will look for different forms of, of, of payment, and a, a, a digital currency, wherever it is, I'm not suggesting uh, Bitcoin, as I've said, you don't know who you're lending your money to with Bitcoin, but I don't know, if the ECB or the Fed issued a, 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 um, a, a central bank digital currency, why don't we all use it? And then what's the Bank of England going to do in terms of, of financial stability here in the UK? These are very big issues which um, are not specifically um, connected to taking cash totally out of society, but are certainly associated with it, and which is why we do need to look at these things in far more rigour in, in phase two. And again, if anybody would like to um, help us with our research, um, we're always looking for e eager bodies. So we'll take one final question of the gentleman here. Thanks, it's Matthew Perlman. Firstly, thank you to the um, paper's authors for such an incredible collection and summary of a vast amount of information that's been really useful. Um, the thing I was going to ask is, there's a lot of talk about decaching and you know, general inevitable uh, reducing the amount of cash in society. On the other hand, you've got a, certain items that happen or can happen in a cashless society, negative interest rates, totalitarianism and so on, which you know, is, is a big worry. Um, I just wonder if there's a, the, the gap between decaching and cashless, and you know, can some of these things only work if there's zero cash in society? Is there some kind of tipping point at which you know you can move from one phase to the other? Okay, that's a super question, and the answer is we witness decaching going on in front of our um, in front of our noses. Um, however, the interesting thing is the amount of notes in circulation here in the UK is growing, and it's growing at a rate of knots. And we're not really sure we understand why. One of the possibilities is, that I, oh, I'm not even going to try and answer that question because I'm not sure the Bank of England know either. And I'm only going to get myself into trouble if I, I, I suggest it. Um, but there are a number of, of, of reasons why um, uh, the notes in coin might be increasing. And um, uh, certainly the Bank of England is, is in between a rock and a hard place. It may not feel necessarily that it's all for the right sort of reasons, but to, um, to restrict the amount of cash in society. If you went to um, your ATM and cash wasn't coming out because the Bank of England wanted to restrict it, that would take away uh, confidence in, in the um, currency immediately. So they really are in a, a between a rock and a hard place on that particular one. Um, the other part of your question, I've lost the source of it. Is, is there a tipping point between... Ah, yes, right. No so the answer is um, possibly when the use of cash just becomes too expensive. So we're already seeing a situation where banks are, being, are closing branches all the time and because there are cheaper ways of conducting their business and there could come a time when just the just handling cash it gets it be, you know the, the the economies of scale just just hits them too hard that people withdraw ATM machines that they can't um, provide the the branches around uh, 
uh, in more, not so much in urban places, but in, in, in rural places, and eventually it just becomes too expensive for them. What happens to the financially excluded at that stage? How do we protect them? These are the issues. My, my problem is not, is there a tipping point? Will it happen? Um, different people on the working party have different ideas about whether it's going to happen and whether it's not going to happen, whether it's going to be happen in my lifetime, which is less likely than in your lifetime, which is more likely. I don't know. But I, I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen in different places around the world. As I said, Sweden, you're almost there. Um, and I think the thing that we've got to look at, and what perhaps they didn't do in India sufficiently, is to get that transition right so that if it happens by design or by stealth, that certain people in our community are protected. Thank you, Ian. So I'll just m mention a few closing remarks. So I worked as, as a shadow with the, the working party. So whilst I, excuse, I didn't... Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to interrupt here because I meant to say that in my opening remarks and I've talked about the um, authors of our paper. I wanted to thank Crevan and also Pauline Armitage who sat in on a number of our meetings and our discussions and um, your, your, your thoughts, your... Pre um, for both of you, your thoughts and your ideas were very helpful. So I'd like just to make that point. Thank you, Ian. So, so I think two possible thoughts which I have come to and listening to some of the, the questions this evening and, and some of the, the kind of the thoughts I think which the audience have and, and indeed which the, the members of the panel here have. But I think perhaps two remarks is that I would make. Uh, so perhaps the first being in relation to some of the comments which Sam made but regards negative interest rate policy. So having been a former central banker many years ago, I suppose I, I, I saw a little bit in terms of the lines then inside how you know, monetary policy is implemented. And I think one thing, whilst I suppose it is a difficult thing to prove, and it obviously would require a lot of uh, econometrics, but, but I, I would think my sense would be that in a purely cashless society, I think the implementation of monetary policy should be more effective. And I think that will be in the area particularly where you're trying to encourage spending. So as so central bankers often speak about the asymmetry of uh, the implementation of monetary policy. So there it's very easy to kind of take the fuel from the fire and kind of take the, the punch ball from the party. Um, so central bankers, you know, will we'll argue that it's very easy to tighten uh, monetary conditions, but on the flip side, when you loosen things, sometimes there becomes a point where things become so loose that actually people don't want to spend anyway and they don't want to, banks don't want to lend. So they're the, what they call kind of pushing on a string. So I think if you did have a purely cashless society, um, there would be no ability for people to hoard cash. So if you're earning a negative interest rate on your um, bank account, you know, you, you might argue that that perhaps would be a good thing in terms of trying to encourage spending. So the final remark I would make is in relation to the cryptocurrencies, which has you know, been receiving a lot of attention recently. Uh, if you look at the global market cap, it's about $500 billion. It was a couple of billion this time 12 months ago. So I think my thoughts around that are, number one, uh, really how I see it is that cryptocurrencies prove that you can use the internet network to safely and uh, securely transmit information. So you have various different types of cryptocurrencies, but, but I think what, the, what that large uh, increase in value, really what that demonstrates is, and perhaps, you know, why haven't we been thinking about this before? And obviously now that everyone has a handheld device and everyone is essentially plugged into the internet, 24/7. That really opens up the the idea behind. Yes, you know that this is a network that you can safely and securely um, send transactions. So I, I think there will be some kind of movement in, in this area, and I'm, I'm sure um, you know that there will be the, the, the banks and, and central banks and everybody else will um, contribute to this topic. So certainly, very very exciting times. So a few final things which I will do. Uh, I will mention that the Working Party is entering into phase two. So if there are any 
any volunteers or anyone who's very excited in this area, we would be very glad to hear from any volunteers and uh, you can uh, contact the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries if you wish to express interest. My final job this evening really is to thank all of the, all of the, the panel members here, in, in particular I think the, the working party members who have put in a tremendous amount of effort over the last year and, 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 and even longer. Uh, they have um, contributed uh, a huge amount to, to, to this discussion and, and obviously uh, it continues. I would also like to thank Parrot, who is the chair of the Finance and Research Subcommittee, which, which I sit on, and I would like to thank Parrot for, for his opening re remarks this evening as well. And finally, I would like to thank our audience and you for attending here this evening and for contributing to what has been a very lively discussion. And with that, I will close the meeting.